Hey, it's Alan, and I just wanted to let you know that you can now listen to the ongoing history of new music early and ad-free on Amazon Music, included with Prime. If you want to preserve something forever, what's the best medium? What's the thing that will allow someone a hundred or maybe thousands of years into the future to take a look at what you left behind? What about digital files? Well, that's, that's risky. They can get corrupted, and who knows what kind of file formats we're going to see in the future. Paper? Maybe, but paper is susceptible to moisture and mold and rot. How about stone? Well, that's, that's close. We've been leaving stone tablets and chiseling things for centuries, but stone can break and crumble, and it's not exactly portable, is it? No, if we're going to leave something for future generations to examine, we need to go to plastic. Plastic is forever or at least pretty close to it. That's why it's so important that we keep microfilm alive. And when it comes to music, nothing, and I mean nothing, is better for longevity than vinyl. So that's right, a technology that's been around for more than 100 years is still the best when it comes to preserving music. That is worth some respect and some study. This is part two of the history of vinyl. This is the Ongoing History of New Music Podcast with Alan Cross. Hello again, I'm Alan Cross, and this is the second half of the story of vinyl. It wasn't all that long ago that everyone, including me, by the way, was happy to declare vinyl dead. But in the second decade of the 21st century, vinyl began to experience a resurrection unlike anything else we've seen in the history of recorded music. On part one of the show, we went all the way back to the birth of the phonograph and traced everything that had to happen before we got to actual vinyl records in the 1940s. Now we're finally ready to bring things forward from about 1950, and along the way we'll hear some vinyl records that I've pulled out from my personal collection in the basement. All right, so uh, where were we? Oh, right. The format wars over the early 1950s. We had the dying 10-inch 78 RPM record. Columbia Records had convinced a lot of other labels to adopt their 12-inch 33 and a third RPM long-playing album. But RCA was being difficult, insisting that no one really wanted collections of songs and that their 7-inch 45 RPM single was the way of the future. It was a massive format war. But then something weird happened. To understand this weirdness, we have to go back to the early 1940s, to a battle involving musicians' unions, music publishers, and broadcasters. The war was about how much radio should pay for the privilege to play music as part of their programming. It's complicated, but the upshot was that there was a schism with established artists on one side and new unknown artists on the other. Unable to play music from the big stars of the day, radio began gravitating to playing material from performers who weren't part of ASCAP, the big music collective. This meant more country and folk and hillbilly and R&B were heard on the radio. The more the public heard of this new music, the more they liked it. And the more they liked, the more they bought. This meant more mingling of music in the general population. And more mingling of music meant more new music. Hold on to that thought. By the time we got to the early 1950s, we saw a culture where serious music, which would be classical, jazz, Broadway show music, was found on LPs, and popular tracks were issued as singles on 45s. And then something totally unexpected happened. Rock and roll. This is the music that came about as the result of that co-mingling of all those different styles of music that were suddenly on the radio during the big music publisher and radio schism back in the 40s. The jukebox had been around for almost 50 years. You'd put a coin in the slot and the machine would play a record for you. By observing which songs played the most, you could gauge a song's rise and fall in popularity. This principle was later applied to radio, Top 40 radio, where the 40 most popular songs of the day were played over and over and over again. And it was a massive success of young people were coming of age. They weren't into the pre-World War II music of their parents. They wanted something that would make them forget the war. As this was going on, the advertising industry was evolving into something more complex. Before the 1950s, there really wasn't any era between being a child and an adult. But by the 1950s, the concept of the teenager, this post-child young adult who had lots of leisure time and a disposable income, began to reach into popular culture. 
Bottom line is that these teenagers began to embrace a new form of popular music called rock and roll, and the record companies began to target them with that product. And it turns out that the 7-inch single was the perfect medium. Two songs in a compact format that could be recorded, manufactured, distributed, and sold very quickly. They were light and easy to store, and they didn't break or chip like 78s. In mid-May 1954, the six biggest record labels announced that they would band together to ship promotional copies of new songs to radio stations on 45 instead of on 78. Meanwhile, independent labels, the labels pushing rock and roll, loved the 45. It was cheap to make, and a hit song could generate millions of dollars. Bars and restaurants with jukeboxes also began to get new machines that played 45s. And in response to young people who used these machines, they began stocking them with more R&B and early rock and roll records. Like this 1954 hit from The Chords. Life could be a dream, life could be a dream. Do, 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 shaboom. Life could be a dream If I could take you up in paradise up above If you would tell me I'm the only one that you love Life could be a dream Sweetheart, hello, hello again Shaboom and open with me to get boom Teenagers and young music fans went crazy for rock and roll. They bought millions of their favorite songs on 45. The 45 was perfect for this new music. Singles pressed onto durable, cheap 45s, which were distributed to radio stations and sold cheaply to the kids in stores. Okay, well, relatively cheaply. Back in 1955, you could expect to spend up to $6 for an album, which is about $53 in today's money. And a 45, well, that cost as little as 89 cents, or almost $8 today. Compare that to what we pay for music now, huh? This format war between the LP and the 45 would have no winner. Just like there's never been a resolution to the Korean War, a situation developed where both formats managed to coexist. And the thing that brought them together was rock and roll. You women have heard of jalopies, you've heard the noise they make, but let me introduce my new Rocket 88. Yes, it's straight, just one way. Everybody likes my Rocket 88. Baby, we'll ride in style, moving all along. So it came to pass that adults bought albums and kids bought singles. If a rocker had enough hit singles, then maybe they would be collected all together for an album. Otherwise, though, a series of 45s was just fine. The music industry loved this situation. The 45 was for what they considered to be disposable, youth-oriented stuff. They could sell millions in short spurts. Albums, however, that was for the long-term, high-margin sales. Now, before we get into the 1960s and when all this changed, let me pull out something from the vinyl library. This is from a reissue of Nirvana's In Utero album. Heart Shape Box, taken from a 180-gram vinyl reissue of Nirvana's 1993 album, In Utero. It's probably hard to tell over the radio, but trust me, here in the studio, that vinyl sounds incredibly warm. And I'll explain what's meant by 180-gram vinyl a little bit later in the show. All right, back to our story. In the early days of rock, the emphasis was on the single. Artists would churn out song after song on 7-inch vinyl. And with only a few exceptions, the performers didn't write the songs themselves. Things were pretty segregated. You had your songwriters and you had your singers. There were very few singer-songwriters. But then came along people who could do both. Buddy Holly, Bob Dylan, The Beatles. And because these performers could crank out songs whenever they wanted to, their output was much higher than the average musician. By the early 1960s, it made sense for these artists to collect together lots of their songs onto a 12-inch long playing album, which could be sold for more than a 7-inch. But this didn't mean that the 7-inch was now useless. It was still the medium of choice for pop music. By 1960, 45 sales accounted for 20% of the music market, and it could be used as a calling card for the longer, more profitable album. LPs were no longer the domain of good or serious music like classical or jazz or movie soundtracks. And so it came to pass that the 7-inch and the 12-inch LP came to coexist in a very lucrative way. If you wanted just one song, the 7-inch single was your a la carte choice. If you wanted more, well, then you bought the album. 
At the same time, though, the album became this new playground for artists who didn't like being restricted by the meager capacity of the 7-inch single, the Beatles especially, and especially after they essentially invented the concept album with Sgt. Pepper's Lonely Hearts Club Band in the summer of 1967. The rock album also gave rise to FM radio, this new medium that allowed the DJs to play longer tracks than they did on AM radio. And why could they do that? Well, because FM was the bastard child of broadcasting. Nobody wanted to buy commercials on those stations, so there was lots of time for music. And besides, AM radio was so profitable that at the time, no station owner wanted to risk siphoning away money from their cash cows. And that's how FM and the Rock LP grew up together. All right, this is more actual vinyl for my collection. The Black Keys released their 2014 album Turn Blue on vinyl, and Danger Mouse, the producer, had an eye on the vinyl version right from the moment he turned up in the studio. The Black Keys and Fever, taken from the vinyl edition of their Turn Blue album. Again, lovely 180-gram vinyl. And you really get the full effect of the psychedelic artwork on that 12 by 12 canvas. It's really kind of freaky. The preferred medium for music throughout the 60s and 70s was vinyl. 7-inch 45 RPM records for singles and 12-inch 33 and a third long players for albums. And things pretty much stayed the same for a couple of decades. There were some improvements, though. Until 1958, all recordings were monophonic or mono, meaning that there was just one channel and not much sonic differentiation between any of the instruments. Then came stereophonic sound, and this requires a physiology lesson. We have two ears because this is the minimum number of receivers we need to pinpoint the location of a sound. This was very important to cavemen because you never knew where that saber-toothed tiger was lurking. This is called binaural hearing. Binaural, or stereophonic sound, involves two speakers with slightly different material coming out of each. Done properly, and if you're sitting in the right spot, you get the effect of depth and separation in the music. If the goal was realism, stereo made it sound as if the performers were right in front of you. The piano is off to the left. You can imagine the drummer in the middle and to the back. The guitarist, he's out to the right. The singer, right down the middle. And the bass player is, uh, well, he's somewhere. See, the deeper the bass, the tougher it is for the ear to locate, which is why you can put your home theater subwoofer in just about any place in the room. Engineers had figured out the principles of binaural recording as early as the 1930s, but it wasn't until magnetic recording tape came along in the 1940s that it became easier to make stereo recordings. And it wasn't until 1957 that somebody figured out a commercially viable way to manufacture vinyl records that played back in stereo. Of course, this required consumers to upgrade their gear again, but that wasn't such a big deal because the idea of a high-quality home stereo with a big amp and powerful speakers didn't really begin to catch on until the late 1950s. Stereo records, with their amazing new realism, had people clamoring to upgrade. There were many weird experiments with stereo, too. Record producers and engineers started to screw around with the technology because, well, because they could. And here's an example. If we can separate the audio into two distinct tracks, why don't we put the instruments in one channel and the vocals in another? As this song plays... I encourage you to screw around with your radio. This may seem cheesy now, but back in 1968, this was super duper high tech. All right, you got your hand on the balance control of your radio? Let's begin. This is the Velvet Underground. Marsha Bronson had just finished setting her hair. It had been a very rough weekend. She had to remember not to drink like that. Bill had been nice about it, though. After it was over, he said he still respected her, and after all, it was certainly the way of nature, even though no, he didn't love her, he did feel like Poor Waldo Jeffers. The Velvet Underground with a cutting-edge example of what you could do with this new thing called stereophonic sound back in 1968. When stereo records were introduced, mono records began to go into decline, and by the time that Velvet Underground record came out, all the majors had stopped issuing mono records entirely. However, mono records from the pre-68 era are making a comeback. And you know what? They sound really good. You should check out the Beatles reissues on mono. Back with more of the story of vinyl in just a second.
This is part two of the history of vinyl, and if you're just getting into the format, or maybe you're taking up records again, this is the story of how we got to where we are today. There were many attempts at improving upon stereo recording. In the early to mid-70s, there was something called quadraphonic sound, which involved specially recorded and pressed quad albums. You also needed a decoder amplifier and four speakers instead of two. Now, today we have 5.1, 6.1, 7.1, and beyond home theaters, so this quad stuff was pretty primitive. And it never really caught on because the equipment was expensive and the industry couldn't quite decide on any standards for recording, manufacturing, and recreating quadraphonic sound. But vinyl had bigger issues than adding more channels. It wasn't properly portable. Now, believe it or not, Chrysler offered in-dash turntables in some of their cars in the 1950s, and they only played these special 16 and two-thirds RPM singles that you had to buy at dealers. I think there were less than 50 records made available that way, and the whole thing was just a disaster. But this is where magnetic tape came to the rescue again. First, it was the 8-track tape, invented by the same dude who gave us the Lear corporate jet. Ford was the first car company to offer 8-track players as options in their cars in the fall of 1965. Then there was the cassette, invented by Philips, the company that would later co-develop the compact disc. What this meant was that by the middle 1970s, record stores were pretty crowded places. You could buy 12-inch albums and 7-inch singles. A new thing called the EP had emerged. This was like a mini-album that had more than two songs, but usually less than seven. And with disco and the rise of early DJ culture came the 12-inch single and the extended remix. Plus, there were sections for both pre-recorded cassettes and pre-recorded 8-track tapes. The cassette really took off after the introduction of the Sony Walkman in 1979, and for a brief period of time, it actually outsold vinyl. But the cassette wasn't the thing that knocked the rotating vinyl disc off its 80-year reign. It was another rotating disc that played backwards, that is, from the inside out. And yes, this is where we talk about the compact disc. But let's pause for a little more vinyl first. The margins on vinyl records are higher than they've ever been. I have no idea what possessed me to spend $38 on my copy of Daft Punk's Random Access Memories. Uh, but I did. Lovely sound here in the studio from the heavyweight vinyl edition of Daft Punk's Random Access Memories. Many people think that the thing that killed the vinyl record was the CD. And the answer there is... sort of. The things that killed vinyl was the 1973 Arab oil embargo and disco. And here's what happened. This is a great illustration of how history moves in mysterious ways. In response to the Israeli-Egyptian War of 1973, Arab oil states announced that they were limiting their output. The price of a barrel of oil jumped from $3 to $12, which sent a huge economic ripple throughout the global economy. This not only affected the price of gas, but also the price of all petrochemical products, including the raw material used for vinyl records. To cut costs, record labels began issuing records that were thinner and made of recycled vinyl. Thinner records meant grooves that weren't as deep. Shallower grooves stored less information, especially bass, so these records didn't sound as good. Shallower grooves also meant that the stylus didn't seat as securely, and that meant that records skipped and scratched more often. And recycled vinyl contained all kinds of impurities, meaning that it was noisy and hissy and prone to static electricity and clicks and pops. Then there was a second oil shock in 1979 after the Iranian Revolution. Higher costs led to even lower quality vinyl. And then there was the disco problem. Through the late 70s, the record labels made gazillions of dollars pumping out disco records. It was a bubble that got bigger and bigger and bigger until it popped. Record sales went into a free fall and a brutal, brutal recession kicked in. Imagine inflation rates of 12% and mortgage rates of 22%. That's what people were facing back then. And they stopped buying everything else. 
Something had to be done to get people buying music again. And this is where Sony and Philips started pushing the compact disc on the record labels. This was a shiny, one-sided plastic and aluminum disc that played with a laser. And unlike vinyl, the laser started tracking the disc from the inside and worked its way outwards. A CD could hold anywhere from 74 to 79 minutes of uninterrupted music. Believe it or not, though, the labels wanted no part of the CD at first. They hated the concept. First, it would mean building expensive factories. Second, it would mean warehousing and shipping problems. You mean you want us to find more space to store a new format and spend more money on shipping these things to stores? Don't you know that there's a recession on? Third, they were afraid of what record stores would say. Retailers had spent years buying and installing miles and miles of expensive shelving to display 12 by 12 vinyl albums. They were now building miles and miles of shelving to hold pre-recorded cassettes, which had exploded after the introduction of the Sony Walkman. And now, in the middle of a recession, they were going to have to redesign their entire stores again? And fourth, CDs were perfect digital recordings. With one disc, you could make an infinite number of copies with a simple home taping machine. No copy protection? We can't stand for that. But by late 1981, the labels were in such bad shape financially that they had all been browbeaten into accepting the compact disc as the successor to vinyl. And this is when we, the consumers, began to get bombarded with campaigns that promised perfect digital sound forever. And we bought it. The quality of vinyl records was crap. Skips, pops, static, overall poor sound quality. The CD promised crystal clear audio. And I got to tell you, the first time that people heard CDs, they freaked out. They loved it. We were tired of bad quality vinyl. We couldn't abandon it fast enough. Bottom line is that the recording industry and the music retail industry went crazy for the CD. And we were all convinced to buy all our old albums again, this time on compact disc. Now, there were some holdouts. The Beatles didn't come on stream until 1987. But for the next 20 or so years, the recording industry made gazillions of dollars from the CD. And the consumer electronics industry made multi-gazillions, too. So it came to pass that after 1985, vinyl sales began to slide faster and faster and faster. It seemed that the introduction of the CD was an extinction-level event. But that's not what happened, of course, and we'll get to that. First, though, more vinyl. This is from the 2014 reissue of the Tragically Hip's Fully Completely album. What we can buy today is far, far superior in quality to the crap we were being sold in the late 70s and early 80s. The quality of the vinyl, the actual material today, is as good or better than the vinyl that we used to get prior to 1973. Think about that for a second. I find that fascinating. You can buy a used album for a dollar at a flea market. And if it was manufactured prior to 73 and was well cared for, its sonic quality should be better than almost any piece of vinyl bought between 1974 and 2005. By the late 80s, everybody was predicting the end of vinyl. Stores began to stop stocking records. Radio stations started dumping their libraries. Used record stores were buried under an avalanche of product. Electronics manufacturers started making fewer turntables, and record pressing plants started going out of business. Vinyl seemed completely and utterly doomed. But it wasn't. We'll go into what happened next. In 1980, with the CD still about two years away, vinyl albums accounted for 60% of music sales. Just 10 years later, that share had dropped to 1%. 7-inch singles fell from about 8% to a fraction of 1%. By 2000, all vinyl, albums, EPs, 12-inch singles, and 7-inch singles accounted for, uh, well, it was barely measurable, somewhere around three-tenths of 1%. Statistically, vinyl had disappeared. So how did vinyl survive? With so many forces trying to kill it off, why is it still here? Well, through this dark time, there were a number of caregivers prepared to give the vinyl record refuge and asylum. DJs and turntablists. 
DJ culture and turntablist performers preferred vinyl because of its tactile nature. It was easier to mix and scratch and sample from vinyl. The club scene is a big reason why it survived. That and guys who wanted to impress chicks with their mad skills in the ones and twos. As Beck sang, two turntables and a microphone. That's where it's at. Rap and hip-hop performers. They kept going back to old-school records for samples and grooves. These old records were revered for their historical importance, and again, if you wanted to mix and scratch, nothing beat them. Punk and other alt-rock bands. There were many groups who never bought into digital, ever. They continued to release 7-inch singles and vinyl albums to independent record stores. Bigger bands, like Pearl Jam, insisted that all their releases also be made available on vinyl. Then we have record collectors, consumers who got into the hunt for rare and interesting vinyl. Certain vintage vinyl became highly collectible and very valuable. There's a whole culture of vinyl collecting. Record shows, indie record stores, used record shops, magazines like Record Collector. And then there's eBay and Discogs and a whole variety of other websites. And that made buying and selling vintage vinyl so much easier. Then we have audiophiles. Consumers who never really believed the hype about CDs sounding better than a good vinyl record on a good turntable. These people believed that MP3s sounded awful. They also hated overcompressed, distorted music on CDs. And many record labels never entirely abandoned the format. Issuing albums or singles on vinyl became something of a novelty. Some made it to stores while some were given away as promo. All this gave the remaining record pressing plants just enough business to keep on keeping on. But overall, sales kept going down and down and down. The introduction of MP3s, piracy, and legal digital music downloads didn't help either. But then, as we got into the latter half of the first decade of the 21st century, something interesting began to happen. There was a small but powerful backlash against digital music. We'll get into that after we hear another record. This is from a beautifully pressed edition of Peter, Bjorn, and John's Gimme Some album from 2011. It's called I Know You Don't Love Me. Sweden's Peter, Bjorn, and John with I Know You Don't Love Me from the 2011 album Gimme Some. That's the vinyl version, of course. In 1997, all vinyl accounted for a tiny fraction of the overall music market. Global sales were less than $150 million. Let me just repeat that. Global sales were less than $150 million. Three years later, that number had fallen to less than $100 million. And by 2006, sales accounted for maybe $30 million. And again, that's worldwide. But then... A stunning reversal. Sales edge back up to the $50 million mark. And every year, more and more vinyl has been sold. By 2013, the global market for vinyl records was worth nearly $220 million. We hadn't seen that kind of level since sometime in the 1990s. Why? Well, a couple of reasons. Sourcing out vinyl from cool bands became a badge of honor, a demonstration of just how much you were willing to sacrifice in terms of money and convenience in order to A, show devotion to your favorite band or genre, or B, show how much you really, 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 really cared about music. You love music so much that you're willing to suffer for this art. In other words, it became a form of rock snubbery. Second, there's been a backlash against the impersonal, intangible nature of digital tracks. A certain segment of the population wants that old-school tactile experience of playing vinyl, ruminating over the artwork and liner notes, and basking in the warm analog sound. This has led to the creation of events like Record Store Day, which happens on the third Saturday of April. Artists and labels gear up for this event with all kinds of special limited edition releases for that day. And it's proven to be so successful that we now see record store releases prepared for Black Friday because this stuff is just so huge when it comes to gift ideas. Third, vinyl is so much better than the crap that we had back in the late 70s. No more recycled chemicals. Instead, what we have is called virgin vinyl, pressed into heavyweight records. The most common is known as 180-gram vinyl, which means a square meter of the stuff weighs 180 grams. These records are thicker, they're flatter, and have deeper grooves. Tone arm tracking is more true, and the grooves can hold more information, meaning that there's the potential for higher quality audio. And finally, turntable technology. 
it's improved. A good turntable bought today for, say, $500 is far, far superior to a turntable of equivalent value bought in 1980. Bottom line, though, is that sales of both vinyl records and turntables began to turn around. Bands from the Foo Fighters to MGMT to Gaslight Anthem to Radiohead to Nine Inch Nails to U2 began insisting that their new releases be made available on vinyl. And now we're in the midst of a modest yet apparently sustainable renaissance in the appreciation of music on vinyl. Here's the kicker. Vinyl records now sell for two or three or four or five times the price of a compact disc. They are once again high margin products for record labels. One more bit about vinyl, and this guy deserved a lot of credit for the renaissance. The motto of Jack White's third man records is, your turntable's not dead. Jack's company is all about vinyl. From his headquarters in Nashville, he can record a song, mix it, and then send it down the street to the pressing plant. When he released Lazarato, his second solo album in the spring of 2014, it debuted at number one on the U.S. album chart, selling 130,000 copies in its first week. Of that 130,000, 40,000 were on vinyl. And that broke a 20-year-old record that had been held by Pearl Jam and Vitalogy. Jack White and the title track from his 2014 album, Lazarato. On vinyl, of course. And that's a fast look at the history of the vinyl record and a quick look at why it continues to survive and thrive today. In terms of convenience, there's no rational reason to choose vinyl. Compared to MP3s and digital music players, the whole thing's a pain in the ass. But since when does the enjoyment of music have to be a rational experience? And there are people who would tell you that in this society, we often sacrifice quality for convenience. Maybe that's got to stop sometimes. Some of my photographer friends feel the same way about film. Sure, digital cameras are great, with resolutions of dozens of megapixels or more. The quality of digital photos is excellent. But there's still something about old-fashioned, fine-grained film. I'm certainly not going to throw out my cell phone for a clunky rotary dial landline. I like my iPhone. But will I give up all my vinyl on my turntable? Fifteen years ago, I would have said, yeah, you bet, take it, it's yours for free. Now, though... You'll have to pry them away from my cold, dead hands. I hope you got something out of this look at the history of vinyl as a format. If you're just getting into it or maybe back into it, I urge you to check out a record store, especially if you haven't set foot in one in years. Visit an audio store to see what kinds of turntables are available and how good a record can sound. Drop into a record show and talk to collectors about their obsessions. Pick up a copy of Record Collector magazine and discover a brand new way to look at music. Now, I'm not trying to romanticize or fetishize vinyl. The, not too much anyway, but I do encourage you to experience music this way. It may change the way you look at things, the way you listen to things. And let's be clear, vinyl is still a very, 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 very tiny portion of the market. But it is growing. So maybe we should pay attention. Should you wish to talk further on the subject, I'm always available at alan at alancross.ca. Just shoot me an email and we'll talk. You can also find me on Facebook, Twitter, Google Plus, and Instagram. I have a website called thejournalofmusicalthings.com that's updated every single day and comes with a free newsletter every day. You should get that. Technical Productions by Rob Johnston. We'll talk to you next time. I'm Alan Cross. You've been listening to the Ongoing History of New Music podcast with Alan Cross. Subscribe to the podcast through iTunes, Google Play, Stitcher, Spotify, and everywhere you find your favorite podcasts. 